And hey, let's thank our worship team for leading us. It's been awesome. Have a seat. Man, good morning. Well, I thought I would borrow from the playbook of one of my just dear pastor friends that's just awesome. His name's Ray Ortland. Uh, he's a dear brother that um, this is how he opens uh, his services. And I thought I would do a little something different and try this. I thought it was so good. To all who are weary and need rest, to all who mourn and long for comfort, to all who feel worthless and wonder if God cares, to all who fail and desire strength, to all who sin and need a savior, this church opens wide her doors with a welcome from Jesus Christ, the ally of his enemies, the defender of the guilty, the justifier of the inexcusable, the friend of sinners, welcome. Not good. It's so good to be reminded of God's grace. I know I need it. Like sometimes just in looking at my parenting, there's some highs and there's some lows. Uh, yesterday was a big high. Uh, the, the kids finished their last game, last flag football game. Like some of you think the Browns and the Seahawks are playing right now. No, that game actually happened yesterday. Uh, it was the Browns versus the Seahawks. We were given the Browns. It was a, don't, don't judge. It was just a, I don't pick the, the, the game names. Uh, the Richland, the, the Richland, um, What's that called? The Richland District gives it to us. Richland Parks and Rec, yeah, gave it to us. And so, yeah, it was the Browns versus the Seahawks. And for the opening play, uh, as the coach, I called a jet sweep reverse. So a jet sweep right reverse. And it's important that you guys know how this play goes. So the quarterback, my son, is saying, blue 77, green 80, you know, and he's like, and then he lifts his leg to put the, the slot back in motion. The, this guy comes around, and again, this is the opening play, turns around, hands the ball to the slot back. He runs, but it's a reverse to my fourth grade daughter who's playing on a five, six boys team. She's the only girl. Runs the whole way, all the way, like breaks three tackles. It's flag football, but still she ran for a touchdown. It's awesome. Felt like coach of the year, dad of the year. I was like, yes. But I'm thankful that my parenting doesn't have the NFL instant replay going on because there's some moments that are not so great where there's some fumbles. There's some times where I'm just like, you know, that's, that's I, I wasn't so great in that moment. Like when, when she scored a touchdown, I wanted to do a backflip, but I'm 40 now, so there's like backflip restrictions on me. But <laughs> anyways, we need to come back to God's grace because there's highs and there's lows, where you feel like a failure, you feel like uh, you, you struggle as a parent, struggle as maybe a, a spouse, struggle as a Christian. We need to come back to the implications of God's grace, not just to be reminded that we're forgiven, but be reminded of, of the gospel, which is the power of God, like it helps us live differently, amen? So this is what we're talking about. Uh, Jesus says this in Mark 2 and verse 17. I love this. Look at this. It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. In other words, those that know their sweat stinks, know that their sin condemns apart from Christ, know that, that they need not just a savior, but a leader. They're tired of trying to be their own God, they, they desperately need not just a savior, but a leader, and yet so many miss. They, it's a travesty. They miss the, the basics. And this is why we're in an eight-week series called Back to Basics. Um, if you guys want to follow along, uh, in a, we have a study guide for you. They're in, uh, on the back table. You can get a hard cop. Uh, hard, hardback copy, uh, or you can uh, get a PDF version, electronic version on our website. Go to the resources section. I shared this last week, uh, and, and you can have a PDF copy as well. Our life groups are going along with us. The rooted class is going deeper in this. Uh, week one, just to recap, we looked at the basics, the basics of life in Christ, and we looked at the basics of building Christ's church, and the blueprint is found in Acts chapter 2, 41 through 47, and so we looked at that. It's one of my favorite sections of scripture. If you missed that, check it out, read it, study it, uh, check out the online sermon on it, and we, this is where we get our, our four G's. The four G's are gather, give, grow, and go. Gathering, like we want to, again, I'm just recapping last Sunday. Uh, we we want to gather and make gathering a priority uh, and, and, and growing a priority 
and giving a a priority and going, not out of grudging obligation, but with a joyful heart, out of experiencing God and his great gospel. Week two, which is today, guys, is we're going to be looking at the importance of the gospel. And yet so many complicate this word. They're like, gospel, okay, that means like being really good and trying really hard uh, because Jesus died on the cross, and so we're going to be good people. uh, And they miss it. It's not about just behavior modification. It's a heart transformation that comes from Christ and knowing him. If you guys had a fast pass to Disneyland and you were in Disneyland and like, would you forget that you had that fast pass, right? Like, would you like at the end of the day go, oh, would you believe it? I was, uh, I just, I waited in line after line and I forgot I had the fast pass. Honey, did you, did you forget too? We had fast passes. And instead we waited in line after line after line. Would any of you make that mistake? No is the answer. You would not. You'd be like, I got a fast pass. I mean, you might even brag about it a little bit, right? You'd be like, kids, we got this. This is awesome. Like, this is good news. And yet, how many of us, we wait in line after line kind of with, just going through life, and we miss out on the fact that the gospel is a fast pass to Christ. It's a fast pass to uh, experiencing God and connecting with God, and instead we just kind of go through life and line after line, grumpy and forgetting the gospel. If you want to write this down, many of us suffer gospel amnesia. We forget who we are in Christ. We forget that we have connection with God. Now, if some of you, you're like, man, the gospel, what does this mean? We have a great definition of it um, in, in the book of Romans. This is in the New Testament. Paul writes this to the church of Rome. He says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is, underline this, the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, to the Gentile, to this is, this is everyone. This is such good news. And this leads to our, our, our questions for the day. You can check these out. Uh, number one, what would you say is the primary message of Christianity? What's the whole point? And then number, number two, in what ways are you struggling to allow this primary message to transform your heart? And I want to ask you this. Is the message... Just like another text message? Is it just like another email? Oh, my boss emailed me again. (laughs) I better check it. Okay, let's see what. Oh, I got another notification. What's this message say? Oh, let's see what's on the news again. Another message. Like, do we treat the gospel just like another message? Or has it become a miracle daily, a miracle in our heart? So I want you to ask ask that of yourself and get real. Is it just a, a, a nifty message? Or is it really a miracle that has implications on your heart? The heart of Christianity is the gospel. That's what it's all about. And yet so many people just think it's about, church is about behavior modification. It's about dressing in your Sunday best so you can be blessed the rest of the week, right? And yet so many people will not be in the good place uh, because they, they think it's all about being a good person And they miss the whole point of Christianity and that it's about Jesus and his glorious, incredibly miraculous, indestructible gospel freeing us. Hey, our passage for today is about the spirit of God writing through the pen of Paul um, a glorious picture of the gospel. To remind you, Paul is the the, the author of this book Corinth, to the church of Corinth, it's a letter that he literally wrote to the church of Corinth to encourage them. And I want to remind you, Paul is a dude that literally hated Christians until he became one. Love that. Like he, he was literally a guy that got knocked off his high horse by Jesus himself. And what a picture of the gospel. We need to daily be knocked off of our high horse. Amen. First service is like, amen, amen. You know, but like that, I, I'm glad you believe it. Like we need to be knocked off our high horse. We need Jesus, the high king, the king of kings to reign supreme in our heart. That, that we would be reminded, and, and this is Paul's goal. He's trying to help the church of Corinth and he, it has implications to the church of Crossview to today, right? That the same gospel that caught us 
would also keep us. I want to say that again, that the same gospel that caught us to begin with would be the same gospel that keeps us. So let's turn in our Bibles. Uh, you can read it on the Sky Bible or on your own hardback Bible. We have Bibles as a gift if you want it or on your, your U version electronic Bible. Either way, let's read it and let's celebrate what's so good in this. But also, I want to, I want to warn you ahead of time, this is some hard words. There's some hard words in here that really will make you be introspective and self-evaluate, okay? It will make you, as the Bible says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Like, look at it. Let me now remind you, dear brothers and sisters, of the good news I preached to you before. You welcomed it then, and you still stand firm in it. It is this good news that saves you if you continue to believe the message I told you, unless, of course, you believed something that was never true in the first place. I passed on to you what was most important and what had also been passed on to me. Here's a, here's a definition of the gospel. Christ died for our sins, just as the scriptures said. He was buried and was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the scriptures said. Do you see a pattern? Just as the scriptures said. So these are, the New Testament isn't just like, oh, wow, Jesus. The Old Testament is the, it, it's the, the New Testament concealed, and the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. Like it, we see messianic prophecies of the one that would come. So that's why it's so in, incredible when we see, just as the scriptures said. It affirms that the God is the God of promises, and he fulfills prophecy and promises, and it's good. We can rely on him and, 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 and rest in him. So our big goal today is believing, and if you're taking notes, write this down. We have God's gospel, so let's be passionate in thinking about it and living it. Passionate. Any of us kind of have a, our, our emotions and our thinking and our living is more pathetic than passionate. I want to go be passionate in thinking about it and living about it. This is huge that, that we would actually, the, the four G's of gathering, giving, growing, and going wouldn't just be like, oh yeah, that's what I have to do. I'm a Christian, so I better try really hard. It's not about trying harder, but believing better in God's gospel that it would, it would become a message that's a miracle in our heart and change the way we think. Look at 1 Corinthians 15 and verse one, kind of coming back here, it says, let me now remind you. Would you say remind you out loud? Say it. We need daily reminding. When I come into the church and into the office on Monday, I, I pray that we're not just to have this office team that's going and Man, we're blowing and going. I got all these things. Here we go, go, go. And we're connecting dots and connecting people, but we're reminding each other of the gospel and of our first love. Uh, and, and it would, we, we need this reminding. I need the reminding at work. I need the reminding at home. I need the re reminding on the go. Not just on Sunday for a sermon. We need it continually. And he says, let me now remind you, dear brothers, and sisters of the good news I preach to you. Friends, we need the church and the church needs us. Like we need to remind each other. I need you to remind me. I, and and, and you're, if you're married, like you need your spouse to remind you. If you have roommates, you need your roommates to remind you. You need, this is so important that we remind each other. Is it the top priority? What do we functionally make top priority? If someone was to look at your life, what would they see is the top priority. Sometimes we, this is almost like a third appendage, right? Like our phone and we, and it can be a blessing, but sometimes it's like, oh, I need to check, uh, how's, how's my bank account doing? Oh, how's the stock market doing? Oh, how's my, uh, my friend doing? How is my family doing? How is, how is, and oh, how's social media status? And we'll, and, and again, I'm not uh, raining on the parade of social media, but like, what is our heart when we look at someone else's social media status? What's going on in our heart? As we look at other people's stories, are we looking with envy and jealousy or are we looking at celebrating? 
you have a friend open a business and you're like, man, I want to share this and celebrate this. This is great. Or, or you, you, you hear about someone that just, they had their dad pass away and you're grieving with them. What, what's going on in our heart? Are we stuck to, and glued to our phones and missing out on the people that are around us? Like we, what, what's the priority? I pray it's the gospel. And we, Paul gets into the nitty gritty of it. I love it. Um, if you were to, to summarize verses two, three, and four, uh, he, he nails it down. And in verse two, he says, the good news that saves you. Like he, he leads with, like the gospel is the good news that saves you. And the verses three and four are the implications of how he saves you. So we see in verse, verse three that it's Jesus died for our sins. In a, I heard someone put it this way, that God, in a sense, is allergic to sin. He cannot tolerate sin. To, to, to be in his presence, we would be, you know, we, we would we'd, we'd fall like a dead person in his presence without Christ being the mediator, that his blood washing away our sins. That, so we need him desperately. We also need to see that his death would actually also become our death. And a lot of people don't like that. A lot of people are operating in a religious resuscitation rather than a resurrection. Like we need his death to truly put to death the old man, the old thinking, the bitterness and unforgiveness, the apathy. We need it to be put to death in his, his death. Going, Jesus, your death is the only thing that can truly put this thinking to death. But then also his resurrection, like Jesus rose from the dead. You're like, wow, is this an Easter sermon? Yes, every Sunday at Crossview. Like it should be. The same thing that caught us would keep us and we'd remind each other of it. Because Jesus died for our sins and rose again from the dead, we can surrender our life. Someone say surrender. Surrender, not just kind of, well, you can have this, Jesus. You can have a little bit of it, okay? You can have some of the leftovers. You can have this, 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 not that. No, surrender our life completely, all of it to him. And his death would become our death, his resurrection, our resurrection. Notice a very obvious and strong observation here in verse three. We see the word most important. The sad reality is a lot of people will officially say the most important to, thing to them is following the gospel of Jesus Christ. They'll say, officially, yeah, I'm a Christian. Officially, but personally, no. Functionally, no. This is why Job 11 and verses 13 through 15 is so powerful. Surrender your heart to God. Turn to him in prayer and give up your sins. Even those you do in secret, then you won't be ashamed. You will be confident and fearless. Someone say fearless. Isn't that good news? Woo! Like, we don't have to be afraid of, like, oh, that life group that meets at the church on Sunday evenings at 6. Oh, I'm just not ready for that. Or I'm not ready to, to, to come to a, uh, you know, to meet in a living room. I'm just not ready to do that. By the way, a little commercial. I, I, I'm helping. Bruce and Kim are in Atlanta, so I am leading the life group tonight. I would love to meet you. We, we, have, we have child care for you. Uh, we have chocolate chip cookies for you. I mean, it's going to be great. Okay, moving on. That was your commercial, okay? Surrender your heart, but we, like, we want to be fearless. We want to be confident in Christ, but we need a community. When we need a gospel community to remind us of the life we have in Christ. To move on to real growth and lasting change, we need to periodically come back, consistently come back to the glory, the glorious gospel of Jesus, that it would inform our thinking, inform our giving, inform all of that. It's tragic when we miss out on God's gospel. Check this out. You guys know that sin is not just doing bad stuff. Everyone thinks sin is just missing the mark and doing bad stuff. Do you know what missing the mark means? You're missing out on enjoying God. One of my friends reminded me of that. I thought it was so good. It's, sin is not just doing bad stuff to avoid 
you know, missing out on the good place or something. Like, no, it's, it's like you're missing out on enjoying God. And, and it's literally described in, in the Old Testament. We see that at the right hand of God are pleasures forevermore. God is most glorified when we are most satisfied in him. Thank you, John Piper. You know, hey, that's a great quote. I love that. So sin is not just doing bad stuff. It's missing out on enjoying God. This is why it's important to come back to the basics and remind each other, man, we have a fast pass to Christ. We have a fast pass to God because of Christ. This past week, I woke up on the wrong side of the bed. I don't know if you guys ever do that. I felt like I was more like a grizzly bear waking up out of hibernation, and I, I asked one of my bear cubs to do something, and they got a little creative in their response. Okay. They got a little creative. And I didn't like that creativity. I didn't appreciate it one bit. Before I ate that bear cub, I stopped myself. And I, uh, the Holy Spirit stopped me, helped me be self-aware, and I realized, hmm. And so I said out loud, I go, Daddy's not saying, I, I have nothing nice to say right now. I'm, and so because of that, I need to take a time out. And there's bystanders. Do you guys know that? There's, like, there's, it's not just that one child you have. You have there's the, the, the bystanders are watching how you're dealing with that. So they're, they're just like, you know, I'm kidding. They're not doing that, okay? So whatever, like you get pulled over, people are like, uh, you know, to the poor policeman. They're just like, oh, waiting for you to mess up. But, but no, I, kids are mirrors of you, right? So like the next time your three-year-old rolls their eyes or something, it's like, oh, did I? Or did, you know, like we, we gotta watch ourselves. But anyways, w w one of the children was struggling, but really I was the one struggling. And I needed to be reminded of the gospel. So I said out loud to everyone uh, in the living room, I said, I need to stop and remind myself of God's tenderness towards me, his gentleness towards me. In fact, I, I wrote this list for you guys. You can see it. Um, here it is. His forgiveness helps me forgive. Thinking about that and praying that, his tenderness helps me be tender. His patience helps me be patient. Now, I'm going I'm to flip from, from parenting to marriage for a second. His affection makes me affectionate. Maybe you're kind of plateauing in your, your relationship with your spouse or you're struggling. His affection makes me affectionate. And this is for everyone, not, not just the married people, not just the married peeps in the house. It's for everyone. Like, it helps us love others when we think about the implications of him loving us. And then the last one, this is my favorite. Okay, I said, this is a bonus the parents out there that want to have a little fun, remember, kids, that his discipline helps me discipline you. No, don't do it like that in a devious way. Just did that for fun. No, you don't want to do it like that. But if we know our Bibles, like those that he chastised, those that he disciplines, he loves. He loves. And so we have to remember, as we're disciplining, are we actually loving our kids in that? And be reminded, man, I need parenting from God. I need discipline. So again, thinking about the gospel's huge. And C.J. Mahaney, pastor, author, says this, uh, and I really encourage you to take notes on this. If there's anything in life we should be passionate about, it's the gospel. And I don't mean passionate only about sharing it with others. I mean passionate about thinking about it dwelling on it, rejoicing in it, allowing it to color the way we look at the world, only one thing can have first importance to each of us, and the only thing ought to be the gospel. This is such a good quote. I, this is in your uh, Back to Basics pamphlets. Uh, good, good quote. Encourage you to, to think on it. John 3, 16 through 17. In my DNA group that meets on Thursday, and I have two different groups, one that's on Thursday mornings and Friday mornings at the local. We're meeting for coffee. And I, and I told him, hey, would someone turn to John 3, 16? And one of them was like, oh, I, I got that. I'm like, well, we're gonna go all the way through 18. You got all that memorized? I, I don't have all of it memorized. And, and so we looked at it all the way to 18, which we're, this is a bonus. We're not looking at it right now. But it's like, if you want to live in the light, we've got to bring our darkness into the light. Some of the unbelief we're struggling with, 
into the light. But let's look at 16 and 17. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God sent his son into the world not to judge the world but to save the world. Watch this. Through him. That's huge. The key is through. Not our good works. Through. Not our church attendance. Through Jesus Christ and thinking about him. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. The gospel is a person as well. Like we need to know him. So our big goal, again, is believing. We have, we have God's gospel. So let's be passionate in thinking about it and living it out. This next part of the sermon is so this is a segue now, and this is a tough one. Pay attention. We don't want just good gospel doctrine, but good gospel culture. In other words, we don't want just good orthodoxy. We want good orthopraxis or praxy, where we're actually practicing our faith. If I'm still losing you for a second, what, what this means, like the word doctrine means like belief. What are our beliefs? So I, I, I had this, this image of like a trampoline. If we're jumping on a trampoline, and, and this is kind of Christian corniness at its best, like jumping with the joy of Jesus on that trampoline. Some of us are just sitting and frowning on the trampoline. If my kids are ever sitting, I know that like someone elbowed someone or there was a black eye or I don't know. But like, so if we're jumping, the springs, the springs, you know, the coils of the trampoline are the doctrine. It's our beliefs. Uh, and, and so we can't jump if we don't have also good, good gospel doctrine. And so it's a both and. The joy of Jesus gives us the ability to jump and, and good doctrine helps us, and it keeps us informed and, and, and on the trampoline and not off in the woods or <laughs> something. Some of us have this, like, and by the way, doctrine, like, like think about like the doctrine of the Trinity, like having a good belief in uh, that God is a community among himself, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, three, and yet one. This is huge. Like, that's important to know that. That Jesus, the supremacy of Christ, that deity took on humanity, that he's the firstborn over all creation. All things were made through him. He was not an idea that sat on God's desk that finally got activated at Bethlehem. He's always been. Like, this is important to have doctrine, good Solid belief. It helps us stay on the trampoline, right? And then the spirit helps us, the gospel helps us actually jump with joy. But some of us, we, we have this great gospel doctrine, but terrible gospel living, terrible gospel culture. In fact, some of us have an ugly anti-gospel culture and community. I recently saw a picture that I, and I want you to listen, I, I would not put this picture up on the screen. I thought about it, but I, in my eyes, this is like a rated R, like not appropriate for any setting, any venue. It's, it's that gross. And you're like, geez, it's just, it's just a row of guys um, lined up, almost like football players just lined up in rows. What's so, and, and in the back of the row, it says Jesus saves. Why would you, pastor, why would you not put that photo up on the screen because that photo is a bunch of men in Ku Klux Klan and KKK garb. And it's interesting. This is exactly, some of you just thought I did a tangent. No, I did not. These guys have good doctrine. It says Jesus saves in like a 30 foot poster, loud and clear. Wow, Jesus saves, but an anti-gospel community ugly racism, right? And we can sit here and go like this. Oh, shame on you, you guys, you KKK. And, oh, terrible. And then we could even look at Israel. We could, in fact, we could look at Isaiah 121 and see these guys are pretty ugly. Look at this. See how Jerusalem, once so faithful, once had this godly doctrine, but ugly community. Watch this. See how Jerusalem, once so faithful, has become a prostitute. Once the home of justice and righteousness, she is now filled with murderers. It's easy to look at a photo and look at 
look, look at this text and go, oh, those guys. And yet, what does Jesus say? To even look with lust is to commit adultery. What does Jesus say? To hate our brother, to, to hate fellow man, is to murder them. Ooh, interesting. One of the most cutting points of my whole sermon is, is, is right here. I hope you're listening. Their problem was not what they believed officially, but who they were personally. I'll say it again. Our problem is not who we believe in officially, it's who are we personally? Who do we literally think about? Do we have a personal relationship? We have to be careful that we don't betray the gospel message by, by not ever letting it change how we do community and family and parenting and marriage and singleness. For some of you that are single, like it, it should, like how beautiful is it to meet someone that's single and yet to get a picture of community and family from someone that's single. You guys know anyone like that? Where it's like, oh, my marriage gets better when I hang out with a single person. Uh, my, my family gets way better when I hang out. My, my relationship with Jesus gets way better when I hang out with a single person. Was Jesus ever married? No. The Apostle Paul? Like sometimes we treat single people like lepers Oh, you're single. Oh, that's a little weird. We'll find you someone. We'll find you someone. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> Tinder will find... No, I'm kidding. That's, that was a joke. Terrible. Don't edit that. Christ's death and resurrection should be the center of our message, but also the focus of what our, our emotions, what we think about. In fact, I love it. Our, our worship director had us clapping, but how many of us, boy, we clapped on beat. We, we sang the right words. It's almost like we chewed gum and clapped and sang at the same time, you know, like skipping rope, and I, I got it, and, but did we, what did our emotions, were they really connected, connecting with God? What do we think about? A lot of our sinful struggles and situation is a result of bad, our own personal bad psychology. Like our, our struggles and our present situation is a result of our bad, bad psychology, our bad thinking, our self-talk. What are we thinking about all day long? What do we come back to? I love this Proverbs 23, 7. For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. I'll say it again. For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. What do you think about all day long? I don't know about you, but my self-talk, and I have this on the screen, my self-talk must cry out to my Savior, otherwise I find myself stupidly trying to be my own Savior. In this passage, it's very interesting. It's not as much about Christ's resurrection as it is our own. Have you... Are you operating in a religious resuscitation or is it truly a, a spirit-empowered resurrection? Like, are you walking in that? Are you living in that? If you're at the gym and your eyes are wandering at, at things you shouldn't, you know, and, and not seeing, man, oh, man, that person's really fit. Or are you gawking and going, oh, I wish that person was, was mine or whatever. Like, we need to let the gospel inform lustful thinking selfish thinking and change the way we look at, at life. There's a, a table I want to show you. It's going to show you the dichotomy, the difference between the gospel and an empty religion. Look at it now. No, the first one, the gospel is news about what Jesus has done for us. And by the way, this, this table, you can, ha you can have a copy and access to this on the orange table. This is all in here. Here's, here's one of the tables right here. You can see it like, encourage you to get the PDF version. It's on crossfeedcommunity.com. Go to the resources. I'm, I'm saying this again. Why am I saying this again? Because I don't want, we, we're not here to spoon feed you. Like, go and make disciples. Go and take someone and, and, and sit down and have coffee with them and go, like, man, check this out. This is so huge. And then on the next page, there's, look at this. It's, it's John 3, 16 through 17. Let's look that up. Wow. Let's, and make disciples. Here's a great way to start making disciples. But the gospel is news about what Jesus has done for us. 
Religion is instructions about what we must do for God. Number two, the gospel elicits, elicits joy and gratitude. Religion elicits fear and stress. The gospel sends messengers who spread the good news that our lives are safe because of King Jesus. Jesus' victory. And then the next one, look at it. Religion sends commanders who tell people they must fight for themselves if they want to save their lives. And how sad is it seeing people following an empty religion? Because it's all about a religious resuscitation and they're, oh, okay, that message helped me kind of try a little harder. No, point people back to the grace of God, the goodness of God. And this is the, the gospel is that salvation is a free gift. Like we have a fast pass to him. Why are we waiting in the long lines of the world when we have connection and access to God? Like let's share this and inform this. It, the gospel implications should change how we parent, change our marriage, change how we go to work. Religion is salvation is earned. You better earn it. You better try hard. And our, if, if we operate in this way, our disciples that will make the disciples, the, because we are making disciples, whether you like it or not, will always operate in a place of anxiety and fear and never feeling like they, they, they're going to measure up and see God and his gospel in this looming, they'll see God in like a looming shadow that's over them where he, he's, and it's like duck, duck, goose, it's like duck, duck, dam, duck, duck, dam, you know, and we'll see that instead of like, no, man, the gospel is, is free, it's a free gift, it's a fast pass to him. Obedience out of the gospel flows, it flows out of receiving acceptance and forgiveness. Religion, it produces obedience that is striving to earn acceptance. The gospel is like our standing with God is certain. In religion, it's uncertain. You never know where you stand with God. You're always confused. So again, I want to remind you, our big goal is believing that we have God's gospel. So let's be passionate in thinking about it and living it out, which leads us to our, our conclusion in looking at the so what. So what? How, how does this sermon and this passage relate to my life? How can I live differently? Number one, if being a Christian means living from the overflow of joy in Jesus, would you say that you are a Christian? Get honest for a second. If someone is to look at you and Christianity is a trampoline, would they see you sitting or jumping? Where are you at? Number two, what is keeping you from thinking about the gospel? And number three, in what ways does your life need to be wrecked and rebuilt by Jesus? I want to come back to that analogy for a second of the trampoline. Like, like some of us, like this is, this is what like blows um, my mind is sometimes I'll be limping on the trampoline. Sometimes I'm laying down. And like the gospel is coming back to the fact that like when I'm jumping, it's him lifting me up and holding me, not, not mad at me that I'm limping. Um, that is so good to come back to that. Because that like, <laughs> I don't want you to mishear that and go, oh, I'm on the ground laying down. I must, must be headed to hell. I don't know him. It's like, now, if you're, out, if you're out over in the woods somewhere else, then you need to come back to Jesus. But if you're, it's so good that even when we're not jumping and we're hurting and limping, we're still his. We're still his. Isn't that good news? We can come back to him. Here's some action steps. Again, and we do this every Sunday. Believe and get baptized. Last Sunday, not just in the jail. People get saved in the jail. That's awesome. But we had seven decisions for Christ last Sunday. Isn't that awesome? Can we praise him? Huge. And want to encourage you guys that you would not wait to get baptized. Some of us were like, man, I'm afraid to get wet. Don't want to get wet. <laughs> Again, getting wet and get, going under the water doesn't save you. The water doesn't wash away your sin, but it's an outward sign that Jesus' blood has washed away your sin. I encourage you. Again, baptism is not graduation. 
It's initiation. It's the welcome. It's one of the first steps. And the, number two, ask about getting into a life group. I'll tell you what, like on Monday morning, as pastors, we come back and look at like, how's the church doing? How many people showed up? Uh, how's giving? How's the financial giving? My favorite number to look at is who filled out a connection card. And I'm being real with you. When there's one or two, I get a little sad about that because it's like, man, we're a church of 400. Like, it would be, wouldn't that be sweet if 400 people filled out connection cards? And you can do that online. There's a, a digital connection card or in the seat pocket in front of you where you're going, man, man, the Holy Spirit, pastors, will you pray for me? The Holy Spirit worked on me in the sermon. Man, will you pray that it would work on me on Monday, that I wouldn't get gospel amnesia? Will you pray for me, pastor? And how can I pray for you, pastors? How can I pray? Like, Let's fill those out. Drop them in the, uh, in the giving box on your way out. Like, write those down. Let's not just gather together. Let's pray together. Let's, let's share together what's going on. Make gathering, giving, growing, and going a priority because the gospel is of first importance. We, and we believe it's the power of God. Let's pray. Jesus, help us right now. Just.